So I'd like to uh, call to order the uh, Sunderland Elementary School Committee meeting uh, Tuesday, February 1st at 6 p.m. And uh, the first order of business is uh, review and approve the minutes of uh, January 11th. Get a motion. So moved. All second. second. Oh, excellent. All right. Any discussion, comments? Oh. I'll, I'll, let's see. Uh, go around, uh, Peter. Yes. Jessica. Yes. Megan. Yes. Keith. Yes. Greg. Yes. Outstanding. All right. And then we have uh, financial statements and warrants. We've signed online, I believe. I'm going to share my screen because we have some revolving fund data to go over. So I just figure it's easier to put it up for us. Um, but nine warrants were signed, totaling $113,574.75 since the last meeting. Um, and I did send you the general fund and school choice reports. Those were uh, including expenses through January 31st. I'm happy to take questions, but I did just want to point out a couple of things. While I don't have any concerns about the budget, if you look at the last page, we've got about 171000 remaining to be spent this fiscal year. So, you know, we're not near... Um, any problems with the budget by any means, but there are a few negative accounts. So I just wanted to point out a few things for you. Um, if you look at the classroom teacher line, you'll notice that the early childhood teacher line is over budget. That actually won't end up being over budget. If you remember, I've explained that we're currently working on implementing payroll in our database in a different way. And all of the funds are not in the system yet. So that teacher gets actually paid 10000 from the Early Childhood Revolving Fund. So that 10000 will get moved over once payroll is finished with the setup. Um, under the IA line, you'll see some savings there. We've had some transitions throughout the year of staff. Um, we currently have a vacancy as well. So those budgets or those um, salaries aren't fully expended. Uh, but that's an explanation for you why there's so much money remaining in that account. Uh, software and technology for network-related expenses, this shows up on page four and page five. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because when we talk about the FY23 budget, the initial draft included additional money for this exact purpose. Both of those lines are overdrawn by about $8,000. So we're looking to write those accounts for next year. Special education transportation, also over budget. We've talked about that. We've seen significant increased costs in our special education runs this year. But again, just pointing those out for you. And then the last piece uh, is in regards to buildings general repairs. So we are overdrawn on that fund um, line item as well. Um, Bill did give me some info on that. So if anyone has questions, you know, in particular, uh, so there's been some HVAC repairs that have come up. It's nothing extraordinary. It's not the expense that you got an email from Darius about last month, that $18,000 expense for the hot water heater issue. That is being paid from school choice. This is just general maintenance. Um, had some windows repaired, those kinds of things. So we're overdrawn on that account. Again, not concerned. We have plenty of funds remaining through the year. We're going to have savings in some lines to offset the overages, but I was just trying to be proactive in answering some possible questions. The one last piece to bring up um, before I keep going is that we are going to have an increase in our regular transportation costs because the contract is written that there is a COLA adjustment. Uh, last year, there wasn't an adjustment because it looks at two years history and the CPI was so low over the last two years that there was no increase at all. This year, there is a 4.5% increase that is due to our transportation vendor for our regular transportation, not special education transportation. That gets split up amongst the five schools based on the bus runs. So that's in the works. I'm working out those numbers and that is coming. Again, not a concern about overall budget, but just wanted to bring that to your attention. Any questions before I keep going on revolving funds? Okay. Um, so I think Peter had requested a, a revolving fund update last time we met. I promised you I would get that. Um, so I'm not going to talk about all of the specifics here. I did give it to you in advance. Again, happy to take questions. Uh, you will see that the early childhood fund, you know, we are bringing in revenue. We had a balance from last year. 
Our expenses are low. We did that intentionally. We used SR1 funds to cover most of our salaries under the early childhood account because when we built the budget, we did not know what early childhood was going to look like for programming for the current year. And the idea was to build up our reserves so that with the FY23 budget, we could put salaries and wages back off because the ESSER funding was a one-time grant. Um, so that account will be just shy, based on projections right now, of 100000 going into next year, which is helpful for the FY23 budget. Special education revolving, um, we had one student who was here at the beginning of this year. We did bring in some revenue from another district that basically has been an in-out. Uh, we don't expect there to be any major changes in this account moving forward. And then uh, school lunch and school choice. So similar theme here with early childhood, we uh, put wages primarily on um, ESSER 1, as well as there might be Jeff's salary, our, our director might be on budget. So the expenses here are strictly product related and service related if we need to have any repairs or anything done in the kitchen. Um, so supplies, materials, and food costs are primarily the expenses here. So we're looking at having a balance at the end of year at about 55000 And then school choice, uh, pretty self-explanatory. We started the year over 500000 which was a, a very significant reserve for us to start the year with. We had savings last year. If you remember the conversation from September, savings were greater than we thought. We were able to dump the money in here. We are overspending. Um, that 548000 is overspending our revenue. Uh, it does include extra special education costs that came up this year and that hot water heater um, repair or replacement that's happening for 18000 which I believe Darius talked with the Capital Committee about the possibility of using ARPA funds for that. So that money might actually come back to us. But in order to get the project going, we did fund it uh, through school choice. Um, I am expecting that that revenue is going to go up. Karen uh, Ferrandino and I, the special education director, looked really closely at the school choice roster. And there is a student missing on the roster that is a special education student with special education increment claims. So she expects that that number is going to go up about 70,000. She's working with our um, data person in district to make sure that DESE has the right numbers and that that student is included in the enrollment and an adjustment is made by year end so that we fully collect the revenue that we're expected. So I'm being conservative here in the event that, you know, this doesn't happen in a timely fashion or something changes between now and then, this would be, you know, essentially worst case scenario looking at the end of the year at 312,000 for our ending balance, which is pretty darn good. We're almost close to one full year of reserve. So um, I think everybody would be pleased with that. That's all I have for right now until we go into budget, but I'm happy to take questions if you have them. Anyone? All right. Thanks, Shelly. You're right. That is good news, and we appreciate you uh, staying on top of, of all that stuff. And uh, the, the reserve trending in the right direction is, uh, is definitely appreciated. All right, uh, principal's report, Ben. Great, good evening, everyone. And uh, so today, earlier today, Sunderland Elementary School students and staff enjoyed some fresh air during our hot chocolate fun run. Uh, staff and students jogged and walked laps around the building. And there was some uh, snow fun during this time as well. Um, Periodically throughout the school year, we hold fun runs as a way to build our school community. And upcoming NAEP testing for grade four, our fourth grade students will participate in the National Assessment of Educational Project uh, Progress, excuse me, testing next Tuesday, February 8th. Each school year, sample schools throughout the country are chosen to take part in this testing. Uh, the testing results help to produce the nation's report card which shows what U.S. students know and can do. And so, again, this is for our fourth grade students. Half the students will take an ELA test. The other half will take math. Um, the NAEP personnel will come in with their own devices, um, their own Wi-Fi, and it's all going to be um, device-based. And it, uh, each test should last uh, around 
an hour to an hour and a half. And that's the report. Outstanding. Thank you. Any questions for Ben? All right. On the public comment, then. I believe we, we have some this evening. Yeah, Ken Smith, I think you do that during public comment, Jen. I'm ready, if you're ready for me. Great. All right. Well, good, good evening, everyone. It's nice to be here again. I'm joining you tonight to um, speak to uh, the second session of our dialogue series and invite you once again to join us. It began uh, back in November. We started the idea of bringing our community together around the education of our young people and a greater understanding of each other. Frontier Regional School District, the town libraries, and the Deerfield Inclusion Group worked together this past summer to plan a community education series called Community Dialogue, coming together around culturally responsive education. The series will continue this February 17th, and we'll have two more sessions, one on March 24th and one on April 28th. We work together with um, Sapphire de Jong and Tom Chang from the Collaborative for Education, who will be facilitate, facilitating the workshops. The three remaining workshops are titled, uh, this one coming up is Culturally Responsive Education, Hopes and Concerns. The third one in March is Digging Deeper with Connected Conversations. And the last one is Where Do We Go From Here? We encourage people to sign up for the remaining three workshops. The idea of these workshops was to make space for people from across the district to come together and learn how to have dialogues about our common values and to understand how culturally and historically responsive teaching can embrace all learners and teach from multiple perspectives. We're so thankful that there are so many active community members who care so much about what their students are learning and who want to understand what is happening in the classrooms. When we come together in conversation and stay open to learning about our shared values and our common goals for our students, we can choose to be a stronger community for our children and for each other. People who will be joining the dialogue series will need to go to Tilton Library's website where they can register um, for the upcoming dialogue series. Again, the session is on February 17th, starting at 6.30 p.m. I sincerely hope that all of you here will join the conversation and learn alongside other community members so you can all be more informed as you make policies for our school. Thank you for listening. Outstanding. All right. And uh, Vicki, I believe, you have something this evening? I actually didn't have anything prepared, but I had submitted something to the earlier school committee meeting. My apologies. Oh. No problem. Greg, I didn't have any others. Outstanding. No, it's right. different. In that case, uh, COVID-19 update? Actually, we, we just met last week and, and, and talked about things. The, um, the opt-in process has started at Summerlin. Um, and so we got our first kind of round of orders in. Um, I think we need to push more to get more people signed up for it because we didn't actually reach as many people who are signed up for cool testing as are in opting up to receive additional tests. So um, I think on our end, we better push a little bit further, do some more outreach on that. Um, we did, uh, we had a conversation offline that we weren't going to talk about the statistics and so on and so forth. And we, Meg was putting some together and really uh, went down a lot of rabbit holes of inconclusive based on the size of, of groups and whatnot. So that's all I have really for COVID um, update. You also see there's another, uh, another vaccination clinic happening at Deerfield that information is being pushed out as well to families. And is that, Ben, am I missing anything else there? Not to put you on the spot, but there you are on the spot. Ben, you're muted. I was sorry, I was toggling between two screens here. Um, so far between students and staff, we have 145 folks signed up for the at-home tests. 
and our uh, student body is around 190 and we have around 60 staff members. Outstanding. All right. Um, capital planning update. Is that Peter, are you going to? Yeah, well, I'll start. Why don't I start? And Darius, obviously, will add a bunch. Um, since our, uh, we didn't talk about capital planning at all, obviously, at our special meeting. But since our January meeting was about three weeks ago, um, where it became uh, clear that we ought to be putting more capital projects on the table because there are going to be significant funds available through ARPA and uh, we needed to, you know, get visibility to this stuff that, that needs doing at the school, even if it hasn't been the top few that gets, that, that had been uh, previously submitted as far as our normal capital request. So that, um, since that last meeting, uh, uh, Darius and, and Bill have done a huge amount of work in, in, in getting information together. Uh, and we had a meeting of the Capital Planning Committee uh, last Tuesday. Uh, we meet every two weeks on Tuesday evening. And uh, um, basically that whole meeting was devoted to uh, the capital needs at the elementary school. Uh, and what we ended up with, if you recall, there were four projects that were part of what we had requested as part of our annual capital request. And what I have now is a list of 10 projects that we talked about at the school, at, you know, 10 projects for the school that we talked about at this capital planning meeting last week. Um, and I'll just read them off quickly uh, without going into detail about them. But there were the four that the. Uh, uh, we had previously submitted, which were the PA system, the glycol replenishment, the uh, another year of the rim band repairs, and the dishwasher. Um, and then in addition to that, there was, as Shelley mentioned, the problem with the uh, the, the name I've seen it called is dealing with the, regula the regulating valve and various other plumbing issues at the school that was actually an emergency and was all fixed on Monday last week, the holiday, and they managed to get people in and get the thing fixed, which was great. Uh, the bill for that was 18000 and we're hoping to get that paid by ARPA money. But in the meantime, it's been paid or being paid out of school choice. And then the other items that we've that we've uh, brought forward um, are uh, the replacement of the uh, other boiler, if you remember, we replaced the uh, one. It's been now a year or two since we did that. Uh, uh, this original equipment in the school, so it's 30 plus years old. Uh, the, uh, what is it called? There's uh, a soffit and up by the top of the building on the east side, there's a soffit and uh, area that is a bunch of decay. And we fixed one on the other side of the building. and and we need to do this one too. Uh, there are issues with the oil tank and oil delivery system. Uh, and then a couple of big items. There's the windows, which we want to, you know, see if, again, it's original issue in the building. Um, and that's a, that's a, the next the biggest item. And then the largest item is actually the roof. And um, we had a, a lengthy discussion on all these things at the Capital Planning Committee meeting. And there was... You know, a lot of um, there's a lot of support for doing this stuff because it's a one time, you know, chance to catch up on stuff. But I'm not about to predict what, you know, how things are, are, are going to pan out. It's uh, uh, and, and not only how things are going to pan out, but on what sort of schedule they're going to pan out, because this is sort of a new process for everybody. Uh, and it doesn't have to go through the normal uh a budget process where you end up with a presentation to town meeting and then town meeting approves this stuff. But basically the ARPA money only needs approval by the board, the select board. Um, on the other hand, we still have the normal capital budget process that will go to town meeting. So there are a lot of moving parts here. Um, it's, uh, you know, what I'll say from this week is there clearly is uh, support for doing recognition of a need that, that that we we need to be doing more a good bit more at the school than just the 
something in the area of 50 to 150 to 75,000 that we've been proposing for uh, the last two, three, four years. So that um, I think that's real good. And I think that that what uh, has been done so far in the way of, you know, you could say, well, people don't want to hear about the roof or people don't want to hear about the windows because they're big things. But I figure it's better to get this stuff out there. And if, you know, we'll see what we can get done because it all basically needs to be done. And um, so, uh, you know, we're going to we're going to I would imagine at this next capital planning committee, we'll be, you know, trying to put to get more focus on exactly what we're going to move forward through with. There's still stuff that needs to be uh, information that needs to be gathered from other departments. There's still questions about some of the school stuff that Darius and Bill are going to have to, you know, keep being responsive on. And we'll just have to see, I, I, you know, normally I have sort of a sense of where things are going. This one, yeah, I mean, things are going to get done. I just at this clue don't know what, but we're at the table uh, we've got people who are uh, aware of uh, our needs and the legitimacy of them. And so I, you know, I, I certainly am hopeful. Uh, Darius, I don't know what you think. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you kind of clear, you kind of covered the whole thing, Peter. I think the, the one thing is that we're fortunate to have this outside funding coming at the same time a 30 year old building is starting to kind of. Um, squeak a little louder than it has in the past years uh, with some of the things. So, uh, it's a unique opportunity for the town in the sense of having this extra extra funds so where they may be able to knock a few of these things off. Um, but it is part of the conversation we had back in December that right now the 30-year-old building, you know, we talk talking about like a dishwasher and a, a boiler and like things that reach 30 years old um, start to become end of life. A 30-year roof, you know, those kind of things, um, you know, kind of going right down the list uh, it makes sense and you know what we don't get completed in this round then we're gonna have to build a plan from there about how we do the rest of the the needs of the building but um it's kind of, i think we're kind of fortunate that the upper money's there uh, for the town in general because if it's not just the school they're taking care of they can take care of some other there are other you know there are other buildings there are other projects that may free up some money down the line for the school as well i mean any any use of that money for the town benefits us whether it's on the school or not, you know what I mean? Because it's, you know, so those are, those are positive things. Um, I know that uh, uh, Keith was also sitting in on that meeting. Keith, I didn't know if you had any thoughts. I thought the most interesting thing was uh, somebody asked, where does the school want to see itself? Or where do we want to see the school 20 years from now? And I think that was around the oil tank conversation. And I think somebody, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, even said that if this were a different state, that that oil tank would have to be replaced. It's out of code completely. So the question was, do we want to replace it with fossil fuels? So we're going to bring ourselves 20 to 25 years from now. What kind of energy delivery system can we put into the school if we're forward thinking? And then that's a that would take a major involvement from the town as well. But I thought that was a really thoughtful question. Yeah, my my sense on that one is that, as you say, that's going to take that's going to take a lot of work and a lot of um, time probably to get to a consensus within the, the, the town as to what the best way forward is. Um, and my guess would be that at least for, you know, this winter spring that, you know, what I'm sort of looking at is how do we move basically everything on the list other than, the things directly related to what you said, which were basically what we're going to do about the roof, what we're going to do about, you know, are we got to go ahead and replace the new, replace the second boiler. Um, what are we going to do about the various issues with the oil tank? You know, those are, some of that will take a long, some of that will take some time. Um, but there also was clearly was interest in, um, you know, part of my, part of my, theory here is you want to get the other players in the town government and you know the capital planning committee has representatives from different parts of the, of the town government part of the committee and you want to get them all on board with caring about the school okay it's not that it's you know it, it, it's their problem because it's a big part of the town and therefore they're looking for solutions and not just sitting back and saying well that's your problem you fix it and I think we've made good progress in that. And I'm hopeful that, 
you know, that'll be revealed as we go through this whole process that, that we're much more um, collaborative as a town in how we deal with this stuff and therefore get more done. But we will see. I think there was a recognition of that because I did. I do think so. I can't remember who I was to point out that uh, it, it was a lot of talk around the, the oil tank that finding fuel delivery systems of the future is not what most people got on school committee to do. So right. I think that uh, they do recognize that they have a significant part in this. Right. So I think that's about it, Greg, unless there are any other questions. Uh, yeah, there are definitely echoes of that at the uh, select board meeting last night, too. Uh, let's, uh, let's get into the real fun budget season. Okay. I'm queuing up my screen here to share again so everyone can follow along. Um, just as a reminder, the first draft of the budget was at 6.31%. Um, that did not include the new initiatives that Ben had uh, shared with Darius and I, which was for a new faculty position and then additional occupational therapy services. Um, that first draft strictly included things essentially that were out of our control. Um, the wages for the nurse leader position, uh, increase in custodial wages, um, technology increase. And again, those two pieces, actually those three pieces right there are not new things. We're just trying to right side and right fund the budget because they've been underfunded for several years. Um, the transportation expense and then the employee separation costs, um, also things outside of our control. Uh, we are seeing transportation increase across the board. So, um, you know, those pieces were initially thrown in the budget. We talked about removing the 34000 for the employee separation costs and requesting that on a special town warrant. Uh, so that's what we've gone ahead and done in the first draft or the, the first step of the second draft of the budget. Um, so this is where we're currently at. We're looking at after that move of the 34,000 off of budget, as well as a $20,000 increase to the early childhood revolving fund. Um, we're looking at 4.58% going into the second draft. Uh, I wanna talk about early childhood revolving a little bit. Um, one of the things that Peter asked me in preparation for the meeting was for an update on all of the revolving funds with projections for next year. Um, I want to hold off on that a little bit because I feel like it's premature. We don't have enrollment for early childhood 100% down yet. And um, school lunch, we have no idea if, if it's going to remain universally free in the future or if we're going to go back to the regular model. Um, and that has a big impact depending on how that goes. Uh, we, we may not know what our numbers look like if we're returning to only free and reduced lunch based on application and students paying for lunch again. Families might choose to send lunches in versus taking advantage of the free program. So it feels premature to talk about those pieces, but what I can speak to with the addition of these wages onto early childhood is that the original draft had about 85,000 in wages on the early childhood revolving fund. I'm comfortable going up by that 20,000 because essentially what we're doing is using our year in reserves. So the way that I'm trying to think about and have us plan for these revolving funds is similar to the message with school choice, saving up a year of reserves for unforeseen expenditures. And in early childhood, that could look like we have a student come in that's been receiving early intervention services, turns three in January and suddenly needs a one-to-one -one IA that we haven't budgeted for. Well, this reserve fund could cover that. And so I think we're going to have a healthy program again next year. I don't imagine there would be a lot of change as far as revenue from what we're currently looking at in the current year. So what I'm saying is we're basically spending down last year's money and any new revenue that comes in builds up our reserve again for use in the following year. So I feel comfortable coming in around 100000 for expenses in that account. Um, so I think we can handle that change. Um, and then what we need to do now is talk about next steps. So 4.58 still feels high to Darius, Ben, and I. 
um, but we'd like to get an idea of where this committee would like that final draft to be. I believe the um, Sunderland Select Board is asking in March for a presentation of the budget, and then town meeting, I think, is scheduled for April. So we have time to continue to work on this, but knowing, you know, if the committee consensus was we want to go in at 2.5 percent well we know that we've got to work on reducing two percent off the budget because we're at 4.8 right now um, you know and, and what does that look like there's just a couple of ideas out here to throw at you uh, we could move 30,000 onto school choice I'm suggesting the special education transportation expense because that is something that is not salaries that could potentially be reduced over time and be more of a one-time expense versus recurring as a salary would be. Um, I think our school choice is healthy. I, I did give you what the projections look like for next year. Uh, we are overspending slightly, but again, I'm conservative on the revenue number. I put in the cherry sheet number for the projection for next year, which is 408,000. Uh, but that does not include that special education increment claim that we talked about. So that number could be significantly higher. So again, I feel comfortable, even though we keep having these conversations about not overspending school choice, we're in a much better spot than we've been in many years. Um, and that 260, oh, before I tell you this wrong, I want to say that that 260 projection includes that transportation expense, but let me double check that before I speak out of turn. Uh, it does not include that transportation expense. So if we added in 30, we'd be at 236 at the end of next year for our projection. But again, I'm expecting that revenue will be higher than what I have placed on here. The other thing for us to talk about, and it may also be premature for this conversation, but just to get things started here, uh, last time that you saw the draft of the budget you also saw enrollment numbers you would see if we pulled those up again that some of our class sizes are small so there could be some conversation needed about whether or not we have to um, change certain sections that might normally have two classes down to uh, one um, there's also the opportunity for potential um, movement of our ias given the vacancies that we have currently in this year's budget so there's a lot of conversations happening between Ben, Darius, and I about how to best handle all of those pieces um, and strategically make shifts that aren't going to have a negative impact on the population, students, and teachers, and have a negative shift in the budget. We don't want to make a flippant decision this year for something that we'll have to add back next year. So we're trying to be cognizant of all of those pieces. Um, the other thing that I want to point out while we're talking about the budget increase and I'm saying that there's not a lot of flexibility because there's not a lot of new initiatives here. So we have to be creative in how we make changes. Um, the majority of our budget, about 79% of the total budget is salaries and wages. So that's school staff and central office staff. And then of the increase, about 40% of the increase is wages. So this is, again, something that's a little bit out of our control because it's existing level funded is our first draft, our level service, I should say, not level funded. Um, so it increased those cost of living, it includes cost of living adjustments um, for everyone across the board. And that's primarily where that number is driven from. So um, there's not a lot of wiggle room outside of starting to talk about reducing uh, positions. And when we have vacancies, that's um, the most convenient opportunity to try to do that. And I know Ben will jump in if you guys have more specific questions about you know, class sizes and those kinds of pieces, but um, I can help try to answer more if anything else comes up. Peter? i just like to say from what I've been seeing at select board meetings, uh, that the, the select board is a long ways from having a good sense of where the budget stands. Uh, so that, uh, you know, if you were saying, do we want to, I would be real hesitant to, to be sitting here this evening and voting on reductions to a budget when what I've seen, I, for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, there's not yet a, a, even a good picture of what the overall 
you know, available funds are going to be for the town budget. Because obviously the cherry sheet is out, but the town has not yet had free cash certified. And that can, you know, that number can vary all over the place. And um, they're hoping to get it by next week. Uh, we'll see. But that certainly is one big part of the pie missing. The other thing is that, um, you know, I've seen some of the budget uh, requests from other departments in town and they're all over the place. And, uh, um you know, makes ours at this point look on the modest side so that uh, I'm not saying they're going to stay there, but I'm just saying that uh, uh, to me, it's it's premature to be knocking this any lower. It's certainly not premature to, for you guys to keep thinking about how to, you know, make the best use of our resources. And, and, and that's that's a moving target always, I'm pretty sure. But you know, the thing is, we were supposed to go to select board, what, in early March, I believe. And then we've got a, our own meeting and a public hearing a little bit later in March. And I don't know. If, I'm, not, I'm not sure what we do if we just at this point stay with what we've got. I mean, I, you know, and present this to the you can always go into the, you know, presentation of the select board with, you know, possible there to present something different. But I don't know, just my view. Um, I'm going to throw out the question. You you mentioned uh, like the uh, the school lunch stuff uh, is still uncertain, uh, and some of the numbers that uh, with regard to projections for students are, are uncertain. When do we expect that to shape up a little bit more? We're going to have more of a sense of that before March, or is that really going to shape shape up after March? So the school lunch piece, I don't, I don't know when USDA will make that decision, but I don't think that that will have budget impact for us anyway. You know, we've got enough reserves to cover what we need to. Um, the enrollment piece, Ben, I'm sure can talk to more specifically about deadlines and things. I know that we have pre-K and K applications coming in. Um, I don't know what the cutoff point is, um, but I would think that we need more time in regard to that. Okay, so that's not going to firm up till after uh, we've had to get this through in March. Well, I, I think it becomes where things become tricky. Is and and Sunderland has been known to have swings in population of classes right up until yeah, right up through the summer. And so you know, at some point, we have to make it. You know, if you're going to make decisions regarding class sizes and sections. You know, the longer we wait, the better, because we can make a more informed decision. Um, if it's going to be impacts to the budget, at some point, we're going to have to make the best kind of, or make the best guess, or, or you can also plan on something and then you know that you're going to make a reduction and not say exactly where it is. And so then we have to, then we have moving pieces that we can juggle around for as long as we can administratively and then we have the budget which we are going to work with which doesn't give you the school committee complete vision of what's going to happen but there are different grade levels and different options that we have um, if we have to do a reduction um, and we right now we don't want to make a decision because we have no idea you get a four-person swing and that changes everything um, you know that kind of thing so uh, but there is I mean it's where it gets even more complicated is that at some point, because we're looking at some of the class sizes being, you know, high teens, low twenties. And so when you start splitting those into multiple sections, you know, at what point do you cut school choice? Cause you know, we, we've seen this, we've seen this in practice probably here as well, but more, even more clearly in Deerfield where you do this and then you set a trajectory of a class going through that it's not allowed to take in more students and you bottleneck your school choice by not by capping out a class. You know what I mean? And so it's that balancing the two out there. We don't have enough information to make that decision now. Will we have enough in March? Will we may have more information? Will it be enough to say no to certain scenarios, maybe? You know, might refine our, you know, our choices, but you know, there's nothing, there's nothing ideal about it. There's nothing ideal about those. If the numbers were easy, we'd make the decision. Let's just put it that way. Like, like, oh yeah, it makes sense. You know, there's, you know, there's only ten kids in the class. Of course, it's one section. You know, you know that kind of, It's not. It's right at that 
where we see, and we're seeing a lot of transit, you know, not tra you know, transition of people moving from community to community right now. Um, in addition, you have people who kept kids at home that might return. I mean, there's a lot of unknowns going into next year. Um, and that's why we're kind of, putting on a, I kind of said a little bit more there. But I think Keith brought up a good question, or no, someone brought up a good question that we do have to decide how we want to do the public, or Peter may said that, how we want to do the public hearing. Because I have to know that because I got to post that two weeks in advance as all those laws and that kind of stuff. And we can, you know, do we want to have a more refined budget going into that one? Do you want to have the general where we're at kind of now and just take that to public hearing? Because you always can reduce, you just can't increase, right? Um, so, but that will, we do need to make that decision tonight so that I can properly plan. Because right now we're looking, if we follow our normal routine, we're looking to have our um, our public hearing on the 15th prior to, we'd have it prior to our school committee meeting, which is also on the 15th. The way we've been doing it, we usually stack it on the same day. Um, we present the select board on the 14th, um, you know, it, it, right now it's going to be difficult to um, give them something solid, right? Because we won't know ourselves. Um, we'll have Frontier by then because Frontier is going to have to have that action done by March 1st. Um, so, you know, at least they'll have, they'll have an idea where Frontier's numbers are coming in. But um, anyway, so we can do additional meetings or move meetings. There's nothing that says we have to do it. Um, and then town meeting is April 29th, the last Friday of April. Peter? Oh. Well, Keith, go ahead. I'm just asking the, um, uh, the, the school choice chart says that the, it includes the water heater and additional special education costs. Are we looking to recoup the water heater money from the ARPA town from the uh, ARPA funds from the town? We, We're trying to. We requested it. Okay, so that the, the suggestion of maybe moving 30000 out of spent transportation onto school choice could almost be uh, like a, not necessarily a one for one swap, but that would be offset by. Close, system. yep. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, I just, I mean, I don't see how we should be doing anything more than what Shelly's got in second draft here tonight. Um, I can imagine scenarios in which it would be uh, useful to have another meeting uh, in the early part of March, uh, but I can't predict that right now. I would think, I know it's felt funny when you have a public hearing and you get public comment and then you just you know, go ahead a half hour, an hour later and vote the budget. It almost feels like you haven't given enough consideration to what the public has said. But um, I think actually when we've had, I remember one uh, two, three years ago when we were dealing with an override issue and we had quite a lot of public discussion at the budget hearing and I felt still it was proper to go ahead and vote a budget at that point and um, so on. So I, I think that my suggestion would be, Darius, go ahead and just post the public hearing at the meeting on the whatever it is, 15th or 16th. And if we need another meeting before that to get our ducks really lined up, we can do it. Uh, you know, a lot depends on what happens with the town's overall budget picture in the meantime. That's the other that's the other unknown, both you guys in terms of all the things you're trying to juggle and, and also what the town is facing. I mean, I think so we're. I don't know if the word frustrated is fair, but where I get kind of caught up is that, you know, you know, Shelly and I have to do this road trip to all four towns and so on and so forth. And it, it's interesting that it's the way it's set up as we go right now, the way it's set up is we're going to go present, we're going to go to the select board meeting and finance committee meeting, the combined meeting to present our budget. And then the following day, we're going to have a public hearing. I'm wondering if like, can we just make our, since and this is not only happening in some of happening in other towns as well, okay? The idea that we have a public hearing that no one really attends, but then we have to take and create our own public hearing with the, the governing bodies of the town. Why don't we just have a, 
and this is I'm looking really for ideas here, but why don't we just have our public hearing and we take it to the select board and, and we have it as part of their meeting. We open a school committee meeting as part of the select board and finance committee since they're the only people since I've ever been um, in superintendent and principalship have ever attended a public hearing on the budget or only the town government people. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I'm just trying to think of like, can we, those are the conversations where we have to have, and if we have a number then, why are we doing it? We're going to present it on Monday, get feedback, present it again on Tuesday in a public hearing setting and then have a school committee meeting. I, I don't know. It's like, I'm just saying Shelly's giving the same speech like five times, you know? I, I hear you. Um, if I may, um, what I'm hearing is we're not going to know a whole lot more about school finances between now and when all this stuff happens in mid-March, but we are going to know a lot more about what's going on with the town. I agree with Peter that I never mind an additional meeting, but uh, I also am very cognizant of the additional load that puts on uh, the, the whole crazy five family, the five school committees, and uh, the administration trying to do this roadshow with the with the you know, towns. Um, so I'm absolutely open to something that gets more public discussion uh, in a timely fashion without also increasing the workload uh, on the administration. Um, I don't know, Peter, you had something you wanted to say? Well, I'm, I'm thinking it's probably worth at least to, to approach like uh, Jeff, the town administrator, and, and Tom Fyden Kempitz and, and see what their reaction would be to to having our you know legally required public hearing as part of select board meeting. Um and if you know they might be, yeah, that's a great idea. They might be feeling like, no, you know, it's impinging on their turf. I don't know. But I think we should at least go ask them. I mean, I can go I can talk to them and and, and see what sort of reaction there is. Um and, and and then get back to theirs. Yeah, I'm just trying to look into streamline conversations, you know what I mean? Because we have these kind of siloed conversations when it really is, um, or, or then maybe the, the, the hearing on the budget is what it's always been. A five, I mean, sometimes the hearing on the budget has been five minutes. Like literally it's, here's the budget. We all talked about it 12 times. Any other comment? No, no one showed up. So maybe I'm making a bigger deal about the hearing on the budget and we just connect that to the school committee meeting like we always did. I, I don't know. It's just that sometimes we have the hearing on the budget in this particular time they had the select board presentation prior. Um, I also, now I'm overthinking things, but it also, it's your budget, not the select board's budget. No, for sure. It's very, it's very clear that that's, you know, school committee does have power of 70% of the town's budget between the two school committees, you know what I mean? So it is a, you know, position where they can have input and that kind of thing, but it's also your budget. And so, yeah, and, and I would being echo being separate is important. I, you know, I, I'm really backwards. I'll, I'll echo uh, Peter's point too, that, uh, you know, I agree that we don't want to go. I appreciate, first of all, that Shelly has done a lot of worst case scenario stuff. There's some numbers that could get uh, moved off and, you know, getting paid back from uh, various ARPA funds for, for specific line items, but uh, as as the town budget clarifies, that'll really drive where we want to go in at the end. So uh, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit too about the mechanics of trying to combine the meetings, especially with the online stuff. And uh, you know, is there a break where the school committee meets and then they're our audience, or do we just stagger? You know, do we have them on the same night in the same venue and stagger it? Um, any thoughts? Right, you're right. With the with the virtual option, we could certainly do something like that. Um, yeah, because you can meet at if the meetings at six. We can meet at meeting at five thirty. Review where we're at, that kind of thing, and then you know, it's not, we do stuff like that with Frontier all the time. Have a, a, a sub, you know, a subcommittee meeting before the, the general meeting, just before, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. Prior to, we used to do it before virtual. Um, I mean, that's an idea too. Peter, yeah. Greg, I just, I mean, the more I think about it, I watch when the select board and the finance committee are having these joint sessions where they're doing the budget re reviews of the different departments and. I mean, the finance committee is really playing second fiddle there, and um, it 
might be more awkward than we would wish to be trying to do this all, you know, officially at the same time and so on. And it might be better just, yeah, you know, if there's not that much that needs to be said at our public hearing the next night, we just do it a lot quicker. And uh, if there's nobody there that's, you know, if there's a good audience, well, then you make sure you give a good presentation. If there's if there's no audience and people have already heard the same stuff, then, yeah, okay, you can go through in five or ten minutes. And, um, it may be just that's sort of the way we've done it. may be actually the best way. I don't know. I'm just talking. Thinking. We, we could also push the school committee meeting to, it's on Tuesday the 15th right now. And we could push it to the 22nd or the 29th. Um, you know, that way, if there was conversation that came out of the select board meeting, you know, where we want to talk about looking at changes, we have time for turnaround. Right now, I mean, to ask Shelly to, if there was any suggestions out there to do a 24 hour turnaround, <coughs> unless you just change one number, you know, if there's something significant, right? I don't know, Shelly, what do you think? Shelly, you have any thoughts on that or it doesn't matter to you? He's good. Okay. Uh, that works for me. Oh, too. Done. Right, let's, Jessica, let's, did you have something out. you wanted to say? You kept trying to raise your hand. Jessica. Oh, I don't see Jessica. Okay. I can't see Jessica. I she's trying it. Can you hear me? I'm called in yeah. on a phone now of having internet connections. Okay. I, yeah. Darius just made the point I was going to make, which is that I would be a little nervous, you know, bringing in a four and a half percent increase and getting feedback from the select board and finance committee and having to pass it all without any time in between to process um if we were bringing in a two and a half or three percent increase then getting it all done at once makes sense but i guess sometimes i guess where i'm getting caught up we could keep this the, the format that it is sometimes i get caught up in the fact that usually the public hearing is the final budget but it doesn't have to be you know we just i don't think it's ever not been in all the budgets we've done, um, but it doesn't have to be. And we could set it up that we have a public hearing on the budget and then we're modifying it, you know, going into the, we have to have another meeting. So, yeah. The final budget. So would, would it be better to just push the meeting that's on the 15th or, or just if we have to have another meeting at a meeting? I'm okay either way, it's, but it's two meetings. It would be more for the administration. The, I'm trying to think what's going to actually happen. At some point, we have to make a decision and how we're going to make the decision about reducing, if we're going to use you know, the, staffing, the staffing line reducing you know, and how that's going to be done and whether or not we know how it's going to be done if we're just going to pass a budget. That's that's where we are in the mystery. Then. We don't know how because we may not have all the information because we don't have all the enrollment yet. Um, so it would be kind of, you'd be reducing it, but you wouldn't know what you're reducing. That's true. And, there's a, and it may be that's how we do it. I, I have another question. I don't. I know that the select board has asked us to present on the 14th, but do they meet again two weeks later that we could ask to be on a different date for that presentation? We keep our normal meeting so that hopefully we have more information, make decisions about changes, present. It still means that we have to have another school committee meeting, but it looks like we're talking about that anyway. So they meet every Monday, right? Yes. And I would think, I'm surprised it's so late. I would have thought they wanted ours late February or, you know, very first week of March or something. And I'm they, not sure how I pushed so late. To their fairness, they tried to get it the early. And I said, um, Frontier won't have their information until March 1. Right. Um, and then um, I said, you guys have are set for the 15th. You know what I mean? So I kind of told them that's where those where the meetings are that the public hearing is right now currently set for the 15th. So they pushed it there because of where the timing of our meetings were. Um, I mean, they're going to have, 
just by watching this meeting, they have the inkling of where we're at. And, you know, when Frontier has its meeting, um, you know, um, coming up, they're gonna have an inkling where Frontier is gonna be as well. So where are we with that? So Shelly had a suggestion on the, the floor, which is. But Shelly, uh, can I counter that Shelly? What information are we going to have on the 28th that we don't have on the 14th? So either we're going hopefully, to say. Hopefully on the 15th would be able to make the decision on how much to reduce the budget. If we go in with four and a half to present to select board, what are we saying? We're like, what number do we want to be at? Or do we, maybe we don't have to say that, but I'm sure they're going to ask the question of, what are you doing to reduce this? We're not going to know that because we won't have met again. Right? I'll I don't know. It. I'm just throwing well, it out What we'll there. do is we'll just say, Ben, thoughts? <laughs> yeah, that's what we'll say to them. That's um, a great well, idea. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I mean, you just said that. Basically, that uh, we, we may know at that point that a different number has to come in. And there's still plenty of uncertainty that we won't have resolved. It is our budget, but, uh, you know, people who move into town get a vote in some sense because uh, their kids have to go to school. So there may be consequences that follow on from picking a particular number that we don't even know uh, till well after the, the town meeting. But if, but if we're proposing, can we propose the number say that draft three includes a $50,000 reduction, right? That puts us at what percentage? Right, Shelly, isn't that what we're technically saying? Well, that's what you and I are saying, but it sounded like school committee wasn't ready to go there yet. Okay. Right. I, mean, I I'd be comfortable at this point taking the, the 30,000 recommendation of sped transportation and moving it because it sounds like there's going to be some movement with the ARPA money anyway. And it sounds like we're already making mitigation plans to reduce the budget anyway. So I'd be happier trying to reduce that number right away because it seems like that's something that we can do before we go into anything that's going to be extreme. And, and any, the number, I mean, whether it's like 3.9, 3.8, anything a little bit lower than 4.5 is just a, just a simple gut reaction. So if we can get that down a little bit, I'd be happy starting with that. It's going to reduce blood pressure. Yeah, I was actually thinking the same thing and thinking we could actually make an argument like, okay, we'll put that in school. We'll put the transportation money in school choice, but then you guys got to make sure you pay for that one item out of ARPA funds so we don't kill our school choice too much. And that knocks the number down to uh, roughly, I think, 3.6%. And, you know, somebody can complain about that, but they can't go complaining, you know, that's, that's getting down in the real reasonable area. So that, you know, I... You know, so that I think what Keith suggests makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll make that adjustment. You don't need to vote anything like that because you're not actually voting on budget. Right. Um, we'll take that to the 14th meeting. And that's where we'll come in at. Um, and then right now, do we keep the 15th meeting? And we just paint, sure. paint, paint all these modifications is not going to take Shelly all day to fix. She already has those scenarios kind of laid out. So um, I think all that conversation and we're yeah. right where we need to be. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the, the the version version three, draft three will be what we've got here minus the thirty thousand. Yep, I'll work on that. Outstanding. Any further I, discussions? Good. Yeah, I just want to. I mean, at that rate, at that point, it sounds like you're, you know, you're happy with just going on with the sort of routine that we've been following, which is we go and we present the select board, and then it just turns out it'll be what the next night we then have our legal public hearing and and uh, you know hopefully vote just vote on what we've done here and but who knows what's going to happen in the meantime as to whether we're going to have to 
do a bunch of changes. Right. Around. When I look at, you know, we were saying, you know, part of the concern we had was like inf information. We're not going to have a difference in information from the 15th to the 29th. Right. You know, or to, you know, April, the first week in April. We're, you know, maybe we have a, a family signed up or something like that, maybe a little bit, but you're not going to really have that kind of information. So, you know, I think we're going to be fine having that discussion one night and then having a public hearing. And it's obviously the same. You can obviously go down from the public hearing number. And yeah, I think that's, I think I'll be fine. I'll be putting all our work in those two days. I think we'll be fine. All right. Um, any uh, collaborative report? All right. Uh, superintendent report? I don't have one. All right. Sounds good. Um, we could do an executive session. I don't know if there's uh, much progress in the negotiations to report. We met yesterday. Depends if you if you would like to hear. Jessica, I'm going to accept your judgment. Do you think it's worth going to executive session? I guess you all are. I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. You're breaking up a little. I don't know how curious you all are. Mm. I'm really. I'm, uh, you know, I, I if. if I'm not. I'm not curious enough about just the normal sort of things going on. I'm curious if there's been, you know, major progress or something like that that we we might want to know about. But just to get the, you know, ebb and flow of what happened in the meeting or something. I, you know, we're counting on you guys to represent us. And I think so, it's pretty much happening. Okay. We, right. Our next is, uh, I think it's March 3rd. Um, it's somewhat conceivable that we could be approaching the end on that date. I would guess we'll probably need one more date after that. Okay. We don't want to get you in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. You know, talking about it in the, in the open meeting. Um, thank you. All right. Uh, in that case, uh, take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. Second. Second. Uh, Peter. Yes. Jessica. Yeah. Keith. Yes. Megan. Yes. Greg. Yes. Thank you all very much. Uh, meeting adjourned.